Amazon search. Deanne Guest. Hey everyone, my name is Vanessa Nicey and thank you for coming back to my channel. Today I am very excited because we are going to go through a book called Love on the Line. If you want to know how much I love this book, here you go. I love it so much. I can't help it. <laughs> I love this book. Now if you happen to have seen the video I made with my fellow author and friend Bethany Real, you would know that this book roused very different feelings in us. I'm not going to go so far as to say she thought it was a one star read, maybe two or three. I might be being generous, whereas I thought it was like easily a four or five. So I'm going to go through some of those issues, why she felt the way she did about the book, why I felt the way I did about the book, mostly the way I feel about it. But we'll just start. I'm going to try to go through this as systematically as I can. First, I want to introduce Deanne Gist to you. From what I found online, she's written 11 books. I may be wrong, but that is what I found. And um, a lot of those books, if not all of them, have been translated into German. So that's kind of cool. Because there's only 11, I'm going to go through the titles really fast and then just let you know the ones that I've read. And I'm going to go through them in order of publication date again to as best as I could find. Um, number one, and this surprised me, was Courting Trouble. Second, its sequel, Deep in the Heart of Trouble. Now, I did read these books. Um, the reason I'm surprised that Courting Trouble was her first book because is because it was incredibly gutsy. I mean, it could have been a standalone book, and it didn't end up with a romance in the end. In fact, she ended up single. So if you want to read a book that just has an ending that you weren't expecting, especially since there was more than one love interest in the book that she could have gotten with, well, one completely awful, and but still completely worth the read, I mean, I would read that. I ended the book thinking, oh my gosh, how, how did she end it here? And that's okay. <laughs> but... I thought it was great, honestly, especially if you're a single person who doesn't understand why everything has to end up in romance. It's great. Then, of course, if you do want the romance, read the sequel, Deep in the Heart of Trouble, and she goes through several more relationship options, and it does end up with someone, um, and it's a very cute story. Okay, number three, Bride Most Begrudging. Yes, I read it. Yes, I liked it. Um, bad points, good points. She has a lot of Twitter patient value in that book, a lot of sexual tension, um, which I don't mind. She toes the line. It's kind of edgy, uh, like really just kind of going up to the brink of probably making people a tad uncomfortable. Um, but she doesn't cross it, in, in my opinion. Um, the thing I don't like about it is there is a lot of math, <laughs> and you'll know when you read it. Deanne Giss tends to latch on to some little portion of history and then like run with it. I'd say it's probably my only an angst annoyance with her books is that it's not the thing that she latched on to in particular, it's that she runs with it and sort of goes into too much detail and gives us too much of that research. So unless you're particularly interested in that topic that she sort of latched on to, becomes rather annoying or um, something you want to skim over, in my opinion, again. Courting Trouble, it was a bicycle. <laughs> uh, more so in Deep in the Heart of Trouble, it was cycling. But I mean, it's still very interesting, um, especially since it was in the 1800s. Okay, book four, Measure of a Lady. I hardly remember this book because it was so long since I've read it. It was during the gold rush. I do think I liked it. I feel like there was something I didn't like about it. It may have more to do with the Christian element in it. I don't not like Christian elements. There was something I disagreed with in the Christian element, I think. Anyway, number five, Bride in the Bargain. This was about a woman named Anna and a man named Joe Denton. He was a lumberjack, I think. Quite honestly, I mean, again, there was that sexual tension that she put in there. I think she really, like, does a lot of that, to tell you the truth. So, if that bothers you, 
I, I wouldn't necessarily go for her books, but if it doesn't and you just like that little Twitter patient value, then you know, it'd be okay. The thing I didn't like about this book is she kept referring to the tufts of hair under his arms, like his armpit hair. <laughs> there, that was in no way attractive to me. So every time she brought it up, it was like, oh. Number <laughs> six, Made to March. Have not read that book. Love on the Line. That's the book we're gonna talk about today. Have read that book, loved it, we'll get to it. Number eight, It Happened at the Fair. And you know what, actually I haven't read that book. I'm mi mixing it up with another one. So I haven't read that one yet. Tempest in the White City. Now, this one confused me. It says it's a prelude to fair play. Um, these are a couple books that all have to do with the World's Fair, again, in the um, 1800s. I, but when I read the description of Tempest in the White City, and then I read the description of Fair Play, I realized I had read both those storylines, but I believe in one book. So Tempest in the White City is described as a short story or novella, and I wonder if it just got added on and she just like continued it and made it into a full novel, which is um, Fair Play. So if you've read that one, I think you've read both, which I have, uh, and I liked. And the cover is really kind of like upbeat and colorful and makes you feel a little bit lighthearted, but I have to say that it actually turned out to be uh, fairly deep um, and heavy, uh, the subject matter. And, and, and there's quite a bit of depth to the book, actually, um, which I did like. She always has a little bit of a feminist element to her books. Um, don't know that it would go so far as to say anti-biblical just a woman kind of striving for her place in the world but I think part of that could just come out of the history that she's researched like you know you're looking for something you want to write about and uh, here's these women trying to become doctors and so that little bit of feminism is going to come out in that because they're going to be challenged by men who don't believe that they can be doctors uh, the one about the bicycle is she wants to own her own business. And then Love on the Line, she's a telephone operator and really enjoys her independence. So there's always a little bit of that in there. 10, um, Tiffany Girl. Have not read that. Couldn't even tell you what it's about. 11? <laughs> and I think I just messed up. I miscounted somewhere. There are 11, but I didn't number one, and then I didn't tell you about Beguiled, which is actually book five. Um, Beguiled was written also with J. Mart Bertrand, and I don't know who he is, and but he is a crime fiction, fiction crime writer, and she is a romance writer, and they joined forces and wrote this book. It may be her only contemporary. I'm not even sure if it's contemporary. The other ones are all historical. I feel like there was a book where one of her research elements was exercise. Like a woman in the 1800s who had developed some sort of a, she had pneumonia as a child and this doctor like gave her these weird exercises she had to do. And maybe I'm wrong and maybe that was another author entirely. And I couldn't find it in any of the descriptions. So if you guys have read that book and it is a Deanne Guest book, put the title which one that is because I can't figure it out. Now, before I get into any of the elements of this book, I want to come to the first point of contention that Bethany and I faced. Our video that we talked about it in um, was actually on the subject of inspirational fiction versus Christian fiction and how we found ourselves frustrated when we would read a book that was labeled Christian fiction or that we supposed was Christian fiction with very little Christian element in it, if at all. Um, so really Christian fiction is a sub category of inspirational, a lot more could fit under inspirational. Christian is just really narrowing it down to biblical elements. With Deanne Gist, if she were to describe her books, it, she, she said they were historical fiction with a romantic element. I did read somewhere that they called it Christian fiction. She does write for Bethany House. It's a Christian publishing company. If you look on Amazon, Love on the Line is listed under religious romance, religious historical, and Western religious. So if you consider that biblical, which I think that's what it's trying to say, and she is a Christian author, meaning her, her she herself is a Christian, then I guess you would 
um, categorize this book as Christian. What stuck out to Bethany is that there was really no Christian element in it. There, I would argue that there was not none, um, but it was very minute. So I'm really not gonna argue with her about that. Um, there was, you know, times where she would say, thank you, Lord, or one time the male um, protagonist was like, don't you wanna go to church to some other man? Um, when she's in, in a specific scene, she starts praying the Lord's Prayer. So you get the idea that these are Christian characters, but there's not a lot of Christian decision making that comes into play. In fact, there's quite a few little places where she could have pulled in the importance of those things, such as she's really attracted to Luke and she never once, ex you know, questions whether he's a believer. Like that never comes up, whether he knows the Lord at all. Like it's not even an issue. And then later it kind of maybe alludes to the fact that he is, again, just by very simple sentences. So basically you're reading a book about Christian characters who don't really bother to bring in the reasons why being a Christian affects any of their decisions. So the reason I think I missed that in my first go around and possibly my second go around was because I had read some of her other books like Courting Trouble, which was her first book. And she did bring in that element. In fact, one of the reasons at the end of the book why it was so neat that she remained single was that she came to a conclusion that, you know, she really just needed to foster her relationship with the Lord. Um, and she had kind of been wounded and jaded in the relationship she had been in. And, and so I remember that element being there. And even in the second book, I remember that element being there. Um, she didn't even want to date the guy who was trying to court her because she was just trying to like stay in the word and not focus on men. Um, so I think like through reading some of her other books, I knew that there were Christian elements. So I barely noticed that there wasn't by the time I got to this book. It was just an assumption I had in my head. So I say she's done better with the Christian element in other books than she did in this book. I hope she brings it back in um, with the other books that she decides to write because that is an important element to me when I read the Christian genre. Okay, that aside, how do I like the story? That is the part I like the best. <laughs> this book ranks 4.4 out of 5 stars for 2, 4, and 7% for 1, 2, and 3 stars. 19% for 4. 67% for five. So by and large, this book is enjoyed by most people. Now, what was the biggest reason it seemed that this book might not have been enjoyed? Or what was the biggest beef people had with this book? The birds. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the one historical fact that she grabbed onto for this book was birds. Uh, somewhere in the 1800s, she didn't really say when, this woman, the main woman, what's her name? Oh my gosh, Georgie. <laughs> it's such a cute name. Georgie has this thing with birds. She loves them and they kind of give a reason why she does. Now, there was a time in history, evidently, where people, and I remember looking this up, so I think it is factual, um, where people used to decorate their hats, you know, those really great big hats, with, with bird parts and their dresses. So like maybe the fringe of their dress might have like bird wings on it and the hats would like, one of them even had like an owl head, like staring at you, <laughs> the person talking to you and like finch heads and wings like in the hats. And so she was kind of like an, a bird activist, like, she tried to get everyone in town to boycott this one shop because he kept promoting birds and bird parts on hats and he basically just fashion at the time um, and it was just so disgusting and repugnant to her and so a lot of the book was her sort of forming these at, uh, or this group of women that would um, protest and uh, basically just boycott his shop and it and it and, and it ended up playing into the plot quite a bit that was fine 
I, I don't mind that she found something super interesting in history. I, I don't mind that it was birds. The description she gave was like a little overkill, like her being outside and how she enjoyed them and what the birds were doing at the time. Like, I feel like I could have gotten the picture without having so much of it. In fact, the biggest number one beef anybody had with this book was the birds. I mean, that's what they criticized. So, um, for one star, I found people uncomfortable with the physicality. Again, her Twitter patient factor. Um, and they didn't like the bird scenes. Number two, birds. Or they felt like there was no real chemistry between Georgie and Luke. Like, there was sexual tension, but not chemistry. Even Bethany felt like I didn't really believe that he liked her. She's in the two or three percent, honestly, because most people didn't feel that way. I can kind of see how she felt that way. So, no chemistry or didn't like the heroine, but again, birds. Didn't like the birds. Three stars. Birds were a problem. <laughs> the, the physical attraction had no depth. They felt the book was slow. I think that had to do with the birds. There was two parts that she really spent a lot of time on. The first was the birds, and the second was this one scene where Luke was out um, at a shooting contest, and they would release a pigeon, I think it was pigeon, and they would, you know, try to shoot it down. And so it's kind of like clay shooting only with actual live birds, and he didn't participate in it except for, you know, uncaging the birds and releasing them, handing them to someone who released them. And they went, I mean, you felt like you were there. <laughs> Because she spent so much time on that particular scene that you might as well have just gone to the event yourself and like witnessed it. And usually in books, you kind of want that shortened down so you feel like you were there, but you're not actually exper experiencing the length of time it takes to do this thing. Now, it was very integral to the plot, but it definitely could have slowed down the book for some people. In fact, I had remembered it the second time I read the book and just basically skimmed over the whole thing. So... There's that. Now, even at four stars, biggest complaint, they like the plot. They like the characters. Birds. Okay. Finally, you get five stars where almost no one complained about the birds. I think they just like the story. They like the characters. They like the plot. It was like their favorite book ever. And that's 67%. As far as the religious content or lack thereof, I found, I think, only one person who really brought up the fact that they're was no real Christian element to the book but then there was another person in the five star reviews who really gave it a pass and said this is why I love Gist's book so much she never hits readers over the head with pulpit pounding sermons she just gives us characters who believe and trust and doubt and learn to trust again yes that's true I mean they were already believers and they did have those areas of trusting and doubting but none of them really were attributed to God so I would argue that and totally agree with my friend that it really needed to be more if, if there's going to have these trust factors and um, needing to rely on the Lord it really needs to be spoken and and really drawn out a lot more than it was okay, another uh, four star review said I didn't like the heroine at first again probably due to her activism and kind of quirky personality but I grew to like her true Luke was bigger a bigger part of the story and that was refreshing if you have a spare moment this is an entertaining read Luke, that that's a really good uh thing to point out Luke did have a huge role in the book they didn't just give you his POV like he was it's probably like half his point of view was in the book a good a good portion of it both sides or you one could argue that the book was more about Luke than it was about her it opened up with uh Georgie but there was a much bigger uh, character arc for Luke, I felt, than for her. So that was it was kind of refreshing to have uh, the male kind of end to the story. Okay, now I want to get into the meat of the story. I'm going to go through, we've, we've touched on the birds. I'm going to skip that. Feminism, I kind of mentioned that before. There was quite a bit in this book, but that was also part of the... Uh, the arc of the story as a whole. She felt like she could do anything a man could do, um, that her job was important and that she was independent independent because she lived alone. Um, the um, Her work was sort of took place in her little house, cottage, it came with the job, the switchboard. Um, and 
But at the end, the epilogue, it was actually really sweet and one of my favorite epilogues in books that I've read because it was, it was just really cool. I, I don't want to tell you all of it, but basically they, they end up having a bunch of daughters. <laughs> and one of the daughters is like, can a woman really do everything a man can do? And she sort of gives her final thoughts on that, which are a lot more biblically based than what Georgie felt in the beginning of the book. So I liked that. Um, I also liked, there was this character who, uh, I can't remember her name. It was something hyena, B Bettina, Bettina hyena, they called her. She was like, kind of like this urchin daughter of a drunk and she would run errands for Georgie. She ended up having a, a, a lot to do with um, some other stuff that wasn't so great, but she was only like nine or 10. And then she decided to run away. Um, kind of towards the end of the book and that she was going to go off to see the world. She was super independent. She liked only to wear like boy clothes. She was uh, hugely um, like tomboyish and she just really had a fend for herself and you really felt for this little girl, especially since I have a 10 year old and it was like, ugh, kind of heartbreaking. I also liked that she really wasn't able to turn her around in the end, that Georgie didn't really get through to her. Not because I don't want there to be a change, not because I agree with a person not being satisfied with their identity um, as a woman or who, who God made them to be, but because in life, there are sometimes people that you can't fix. And there are sometimes people that you can't convince of God's perfect sovereignty and making them who they are. And it's kind of sad, but it's realistic. And so, I don't know, sometimes when an author doesn't put perfect little bows at the end of their story or doesn't perfectly tie up certain portions of their book, like Robin Lee Hatcher did not in one of her books, like she had a really bad relation, the character had a really bad relationship with her father. And in the end, she really wasn't able to mend that. And to me, that's okay, that's life. So it left you feeling kind of disheartened and sad. So they showed you the good side and then, you know, kind of someone going down the other path of things and how it turned out for them. I, I, again, kind of a gutsy move in a book and I really enjoyed that. Dialogue. This book was incredibly witty, uh, in my opinion. It was funny, like I laughed out loud on more than one occasion. In fact, when I decided to read this book a second time so that I could discuss it with Bethany and remember the things I liked about it or didn't like about it, I had only intended to skim. I started reading the first chapter and I was hooked. Like, I didn't think it was slow. I just <laughs> loved it. I read the whole thing in two days. So I loved the dialogue. I, it was a very fast moving book for me. Another thing I loved about this book were the multiple characters. I have a ton of characters in my book. It's fun because I love bringing in all their personalities. And in this book, they had a lot of characters and I really felt like she only brought them in as much as needed. Sometimes it really annoys me in a book when they bring in a side character who has like next to no role and they start naming who they are and it makes you think they're gonna have like a place in the book and then they don't. This one woman, Mrs. Patrick, comes in to help her after a really sort of um, ooh, like nasty situation that happened to Georgie. And you didn't really know who this woman was before other than just barely named as one of the townspeople. But she came in and they just, she just gave her the right amount of spotlight in the chapter that was needed. And then she was gone again and that was okay. And it was really great. There's all these other men in the book who are supposedly part of this um, gang that Luke is there to sort of weed out of the crowd. I suppose I should have probably given you an overview of the book. So basically, Lucius Landry, Land, Landrum, Lu something. Lucius um, is a Texas Ranger. He's after the something gang. This gang is famous for being polite. Like the main guy in the gang gives money back to like widows. He lets women sometimes keep their money if he thinks they need it. And so basically 
the gang has posed as farmers in this town and so no one really knows who they are but even the people that they suspect to be in the gang like the townspeople wouldn't turn in because he's known as like a polite thief train robber and so Luke has to, Lucius has to go undercover in this town to figure out who they are and ferret them out and arrest them and so he goes under the name of Luke and he becomes a lineman um, like for telephone wires and that's how he comes in contact with Georgie got gotcha. so on the side of doing his work and figuring out the lineman work he's also befriending all of these men in the town who he suspects of being part of the gang and so he has to sort of portray himself on the side to these men as sort of a ruffian um, or willing to get into trouble himself so that they trust him so that they sort of invite him into the gang so he can arrest them there you go so a lot of these other characters that are men are the gang member characters and when he goes around arresting them it's like this hilarious scene i could picture it in a movie it's funny i would read it to you but it's on my phone why did i do that but there's all of these like chit chat between these guys being arrested they're not like these silent figures they've still kind of got this dialogue going on behind them which i just love because i read another book where there was a guy in the wagon when the guy finally caught up to the girl and they kissed and it's like the guy in the wagon disappeared from the story it's like the author forgot he was there he had no dialogue he just was this silent voyeur <laughs> watching them make out it was weird so i appreciated all these extra characters another thing that my friend and i disagreed on was luke himself she did not like him she felt like he was kind of mean and gruff <laughs> She kind of teased me when I said he reminded me of my husband. I, if I really admit to you I like it, you'll probably laugh. He Don't reminds worry. me of my husband. <laughs> I hope your husband's nice to you then. <laughs> Blink twice if you're okay. <laughs> I feel like there were certain elements of his personality, personality that reminded me of my husband. And so I think by association... Luke was a really great guy because I'm also thinking of all my husband's good points. So Luke was not in the book or Lucius so gruff, I think, as to merit like your disdain. He was just arrogant in the beginning of the book. He was just, yeah, he was arrogant and kind of haughty and kind of had a bad attitude about going undercover. Um, he was young guy and I don't know, that's just his personality. I mean, he kind of came into the situation with Georgie being like, hey, I'm, I know that the phone operator is this young woman, but she's single, but she's like kind of old to be single in her, tw like she's 21 or something. Like why, why is she single? And then he sees her and is immediately attracted to her and can't figure it out until she opens her mouth and starts talking about all the birds. And then he's like, oh, that's why. <laughs> And so he is instantly attracted to her. Part of, um, another part of the reason my friend and I disagreed is she felt like that the man didn't really like Georgie, that he just was attracted to her and she him. Um, and, and she wasn't the only one to feel that way. There was other people in the two, three star reviews who mentioned that there wasn't a lot of depth in their relationship. And I can definitely see that there was kind of an instant attraction, but maybe that also reminds me of my husband because it was kind of a love at first sight for me, <laughs> not necessarily for him. <laughs> I sort of tracked him down and stalked him a little, but even in this book, there was a little bit of that struggle. There was attraction, but he wasn't sure where he wanted the relationship to go at first. I personally kind of enjoyed the element of highlighting two people in the middle of a relationship confused about their relationship rather than two people wanting to get into a relationship and ending where they got together like if you want to talk about dating in the 1800s which isn't really a word dating I guess courting um they had already begun courting and they were having some sort of turmoil within that one he knew he was mainly just attracted to her. He knew that his job demanded a lot of him. He wasn't sure if he wanted to think of her as a long-term 
um, relationship because he always felt that he did not want to get married as a ranger because all the rangers he knew who were married were barely home and barely a part of their children's lives or their wives' lives. So he wrestled with that subject and he was sort of willing to just enjoy her as a person he was attracted to. And although that may not be very admirable, I don't think that's that far-fetched for real life. Um, a lot of people get together for attraction reasons and then decide, but do I actually want to stay with this person? Can I actually picture marrying this person? And maybe that's not how it should be in life, especially not for two Christian people, but it is a reality for some people. And as an avid romance reader, I found this particular story a little bit refreshing to find a different struggle and a different attitude um, and a different place in the relationship that I normally get dropped into in a book. So again, I liked that arc. What I did not find in this book was um, fluff and info dumps, which I was very happy about. Um, there was a lot of information on the birds. I hate to bring that up again, but it was so there, but I wouldn't consider it fluff. No, maybe it would fall into the category of fluff. It was just too much, but it wasn't that it didn't move the story along. At least all of the parts with the birds actually did sort of move the story ahead and give you an indication of something that was to come or there was some importance to the scene, even though it was too much of a scene. To me, a fluffy chapter is like, we're going to the grocery store and having a conversation about nothing because I don't know what to put in this chapter and it doesn't move the story anywhere. So that's what I consider fluff. And then info dumps are really more like, I want the reader to know this information, so I'm going to put it all in this really awkward set of dialogue or narrative. And there wasn't any of that. So I liked that as well. And second to lastly, I liked the twists. So I am going to, at the very end, talk about her online presence just a little bit. But before I get there, I am going to give a bit of a spoiler. Uh, some more tension uh, probably for readers as to whether this was a believable part of the story or not. So basically there was this contest that was happening with that involved the hats and birds and stuff like that. Georgie was there and her friends were putting together a contest to see who can make the best hat without bird parts and all these women contributed and they all were set in Georgie's house like I don't know 100 hats in big old hat boxes. Um, and they were in her bedroom. Um, two of the guys that Luke was trying to befriend were walking down the road um, and they saw Luke and Luke was, and it was that night and Luke was like, um, oh, they'd also built like a bird float and he had hidden that for her because there was talk that people, that these two guys were gonna destroy the float for reasons too much to get into. Anyway, and so he hid the float and the guys were like, we're gonna go destroy the float and Luke's like, oh, I'll help you look for it. And so they looked and looked and looked and of course it was hidden and Luke didn't tell him that. And they're like, well, what are we gonna do? And the guy's like, well, hey, let's go destroy all those hats that she has, that'll really teach her. And they knew that Luke liked her a lot. He was not shy about saying that. He's like, yeah, I'm courting her or whatever. But they're like, do you, are you against playing a prank? And he's like, uh, no. And they're like, well, let's go in her house and destroy all those hats. Now, when I first read that, I was like, what? He's not gonna. Because <laughs> he's the main guy. He's the hero. But he really had only three choices. He could beat the guys up or stop them somehow and say, no, you're not gonna break into her house. I mean, these are just reputable guys. No, you're not gonna do that. Completely blow his cover never be asked in the gang and the whole point again while he why he was in town was to capture these guys to ferret them out and he would lose that opportunity entirely which is the struggle he had with liking georgie to begin with he had no business liking a woman that was jeopardizing his mission second choice is that he could have walked away and say nah i'm out i'm not going to do that you guys do you i'm not going to be any part of that uh, that would have done two things one he would have let two men break into georgie's house uh, leaving her alone with them and their godless nature. And two, he would have then um, seemed like a goody 
goody to them and they wouldn't have ever invited them in his gang. So three, he could go with them. So he said yes. I was like, are you serious? So he put on like a thing and he kind of dressed a little, he did something with his overalls, whatever. And he went in with them and he tied her up. Like they burst into her room. He was the one to tie her up with like a pillowcase, like to the bed. And then, but he did go get a shawl and he covered her because she was in her nightdress. But I mean, she's, and he didn't tie her up as tight as maybe they would have, but he, she, he didn't speak. She was crying. So she didn't know it was him, but she was crying. She was begging like, please don't, please, you don't have to do this. Please, please, please. I mean, she thinks she's going to get violated. These three men are in her room in the dead of night. And then when the younger guy does come over and he says, hey, when we're done with this, how about we have a little fun with her? Because he was kind of drunk. Like Luke, like basically throws him across the room <laughs> and then they're burning all the hats and she's like what are you doing but it was like super traumatizing and the whole time I'm going oh what are you doing Bethany I don't think could get past that but <laughs> for me it wasn't that he did that or like I'm over romanticizing like this tough guy persona like oh I like bad boys or you know I like abusive men not at all I could truly see the dilemma he was in I thought it was really kind of a genius of Deanne to sort of back him into this corner and more than anything I love to be truly surprised by a twist to even like be like no you're not gonna you're not gonna you're not gonna you are <laughs> and that's fun in a book and then at the end of all of it she does find out later in the book that Luke was the one to do that and was she ticked like yes very ticked but something I hate in books is like that misunderstanding that comes between the two main characters that could totally be solved by a simple conversation she's like I'm mad at you because and I don't understand why you did it because and all the other person has to do is tell you why they did it oh I hate that so in this one, again, they get to that scene and I'm like, here comes the misunderstanding. But no, Luke makes her stay. He's like, I'm going to have to tie you to this tree. And believe me, I'll do it. <laughs> but basically, he's like, I'll cuff you and keep you where you're at. And you have to listen to everything I say and at least give me a chance to explain to you why I did what I did. It doesn't make it right, but it did solve that problem that I don't like about people not just talking it out. And so they did and she still had an issue and she went home and they she had to deal with it now again there is the chance that then the anger she feels will keep them apart and blah 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 I hate you please don't hate me all this kind of stuff but honestly they were able to make amends again you could have a problem with that and say how could she forgive him for such a thing but I felt like she understood the dilemma he was in and although it was awful, I liked that they didn't drag out that argument. So that's just me. So as for Deanne's online presence, I looked her up on YouTube and I was actually pleasantly surprised. She has a whole bunch of videos, most of them really short. She has these little um, clips that are like just a couple minutes long. She calls them uh, two minute tips for aspiring writers. I just went on there to see what she had online and I ended up going through a bunch of them and spending all this time um, watching these videos because I am an aspiring writer. Um, my fourth book and my series, my medieval series is gonna be out sometime this year. So I ate that stuff up. I was like, yes, I'll take all your tips because her writing is to me uh, exceptional. I, I enjoy her sentences, I enjoy her dialogue, I enjoy her narrative um less the information she gives in her narrative and all the research but nonetheless she writes really well she also has these little um other videos that are short called all the juicy details as a playoff of her name so she answers little questions i was kind of sad because most of these videos were made about five years ago and it didn't seem like she had really anything recent and I think her videos were really fun and she was really cute and playful. The one thing missing from these videos, which I really wanted to know about, um, 
what goes back to the the Christian element. I wanted to find at least one video where she talked about how important that was or was not to her or her reasons for inserting some uh, deeper Christian things in some of her books and not others. She will find stronger elements in some of her other books, not particularly this one. Um, but if that's okay, and if you don't mind that, I mean, it's still a very clean read. It's still fun. She's still a great writer. It just, I find it easier to know that up front rather than being disappointed because when I have an expectation that I'm reading a Christian book, I really do expect a stronger message. But if my expectation is adjusted, I can still enjoy anything for what it is. So uh, for, what, for what she writes, I very much enjoy it and I could go on and on and on about this book. <laughs> And Bethany's probably rolling her eyes at me. Oh my gosh, Vanessa. Leave me a comment. Let me know. Did you like this book? Did you not like this book? Does it sound like something you would love to read? If you have another book you'd like me to read, let me know. I did receive a comment from someone who said they wanted me to read C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. This is not uh, fiction, obviously, for anyone who knows this book. It is nonfiction. Um, I've had this on my shelf actually for years and years. I am a C.S. Lewis fan, though I have to admit I have not read a ton of his stuff. So I have, uh, oh, screw tape letters. Love screw tape letters. Um, I do have this one. I have The Problem of Pain. I um, haven't read that one. So I'm actually very interested to get into this. When I look in the contents, it is split up into four parts, and each part is called a book. So the first one is right and wrong as a clue to the meaning of the universe book two what christians believe book three christian behavior book four beyond personality or first steps in the doctrine of the trinity oh, this is going to be a lot heavier content than i have talked about thus far so i am going to read this if i feel like i can express myself adequately after reading this i'll probably make four different videos to go over each of the four sections rather than try and tackle this as a whole. Uh, in the meantime, I am also reading several other books, but the one that I've actually gotten into is uh, Tamara Lee's The Raveling. It's the last book in her Age of Faith series and the only one I haven't read of that series so far. I have read some of her standalones. Um, I look forward to reading some of her other series and uh, Lord willing, we are actually doing an interview on the 29th of this month. So we have it scheduled, so pay attention in July. You'll get a video of uh, me interviewing Tamara Lee. So I'm very, very excited for that. So click subscribe and ring the bell and press notifications on because you won't want to miss it. All right, thank you guys.